So, wow, hi. Uh, I have to, I do have to remember to say a few more things about Vine because I always forget to do that and that's like disadvantages our organization because I always just like jump to what I want to talk about and forget to like hype the organization at all. So uh, Vine Sanctuary is an LGBTQ run farmed animal sanctuary. We're located in Springfield, Vermont. We're uh, solar powered and explicitly eco-feminist, working from within an understanding of the intersection of oppressions. About 500, more than 500 animals, non-human animals live at the sanctuary, uh, ranging from tiny little parakeets to literally 3,000 pound cows and, and everybody in between. Rose says hi to you, um, Christopher. Come on back. Um, and so find us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, uh. oh, what? No. Um, our website, and, and look, we have, we have kind of a harder time uh, raising money than the other farmed animal sanctuaries, right? Many of which were started by heterosexual married couples uh, back in the day when, uh, uh, only they were experiencing the economic benefits of marriage. Um, we started out as a small sanctuary in poultry country run by two lesbians, one of whom is not quite white and the other one is not quite clear what her gender might be. Um, so we had kind of a rough time and we still have kind of a rough time uh, raising money, all of which is to say if you have a few dollars to toss to a farmed animal sanctuary, please think about us because uh, we literally take care of more than twice as many animals on less than a third of the budget of other major farmed animal sanctuaries. So that's all. Yay for freeganism. Um, all right, so here we are, and I've already exercised um, Christopher's, one of Christopher's rights, which was the right to be uncomfortable, because um, I got a little uncomfortable when I, when I came here. I'm just, oh, and I'm also gonna exercise the right to be real. Did you say that one? All right, so, 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 so when I drove up here, like, ah, of course, my gosh, the trees are so beautiful, yeah? Um, and the air, it smells so good, right? But I just couldn't not notice, like, um, where did all this land, how did it, like, come to be in the hands of the people that it's in? And, Oh, this feels like really rich um, here. And oh, wait a minute. Like, okay, so where did all the money come from? And also, who built these buildings? And in what ways were human or non human animals exploited in the process of that? And I'm not saying all that wrecked my experience. I'm just saying that those thoughts were there right alongside the awareness of the total beautifulness of of the place, and, and for me at least, that's what having an intersectional perspective is about, being aware of a lot of different things at the same time, being aware of a lot of different things about a situation at the same time, about yourself at the same time, being simultaneously aware of your disadvantage and your privilege, um, and not having those two awarenesses cancel each other out, but coexist, huh? And so like that started for me as soon as I got here because I, I grew up um, not exactly with money in Baltimore City, so like I feel uncomfortable around rich people. And um, so, so, so all of that was going on and then here's the, the thing is that then, um, and then, then, and then, then, there's chickens, there's chickens. There's chickens here. There's chickens here in a tiny little coop when all five of them are in that coop. That's not much more space than a battery cage. We took pictures and, and they've got a little dirt run and of just like a few feet. And I was shocked. I have to say I was just shocked. I don't know why I should be shocked, but I was shocked. 
Um, and, and I can't ignore those chickens. Like, I can't then now stand up here and give this talk as though right over there there aren't some chickens um, who are miserable. Who are miserable. And I'm sure, though, I'm sure, knowing what I know of the Whidbey Institute, that probably the people who are responsible for this are not thinking about these chickens as these hens, these female birds held specifically for the purpose of exploiting their reproductive um, capacities. I'm sure they're not thinking of them as miserable, right? Um, so there's some profound lack of empathy going on here, right? Um, and I also have a feeling that um, any uh, intervention that we try to make on behalf of these chickens is going to be met by resistance. Um, and that resistance is going to be rooted in a feeling of personal goodness. We are good people. So nothing that we're doing could be a bad thing. Huh? We are kind people. So Clearly, nothing we're doing could be unkind. And we'll come back to this whole attributing characteristics like goodness or kindness to people rather than to actions, because I think that's actually a huge problem that we all have to watch out for. But I just personally, obviously, I didn't come here planning to start talking about chickens, but I personally could not be real without saying to you, there's chickens, they're right over there. Um, and I personally want, have made it my goal for the weekend to not end the weekend without folks that would be having agreed to send those hens to a sanctuary um, or, 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 or or talk to somebody who runs the sanctuary about how to not exploit them and just turn this place into a refuge for them, OK? Um, no, need, no, 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 this is no, need, no, we'll applaud if that goal is met, okay? We'll, we'll, applaud, we'll applaud them. But I didn't come here planning to talk to you about chickens. Um, but this does touch on things that I was planning to talk to you about because I, I said if we tried to do something about this, we would probably encounter some resistance. And that's not, you know, just coming out of my head, but coming out of some experiences, including some experiences that I wrote about in a book called The Oxen at the Intersection. Um, the oxen at the intersection, which goes into uh, in more detail a lot of the things I'm going to talk about here today. So, 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 so of the things that I've written, that's the thing that I recommend um, the, 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 the most. Um, and, and in that situation, we did encounter quite a bit of resistance rooted in this idea of personal goodness which we'll come back to. But actually, who I meant to start out talking to you about, I think my talk says, I think the title of my talk is something like, What, what, what Can Mad Cows and um, Queer Ducks uh, Teach Us About Intersectionality? Huh? And so I meant to start talking to you about this cow called Maddox, um, who, 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 who came to Vine Sanctuary uh, as a calf um, four days old. Um, having been born on a dairy farm um, and allowed to see his mother just long enough uh, for the sight of him to start her milk flowing. This is what happens on dairy farms for those of you who are not um, aware. And this is a humane dairy farm, uh, one that actually tourists come to and they look at the cows and they eat ice cream on site. Um, and, and, and so he was allowed to be with his mother for the one day and then was taken away. And then he lucked out. And he lucked out because he was born late in the afternoon of a Wednesday. And Wednesday is the day when the guy comes from the veal places to buy all the calves. And so the veal guy was already gone. And so Maddox did not go to the veal place because he was born just a few hours after that. And so he was essentially a discard. Um, not useful to the farmer anymore, and a neighbor was able to get him and bring him to sanctuary, right? Uh, so he came to us at four months old, immediately became part of our interspecies community. One thing we do differently at Vine than other farmed animal sanctuaries is we don't segregate animals by um, species because um, we respect the right of self-determination, and we like having friends of other species, um, and so do, so do many other animals. Uh, so he actually became very close friends with a, with a lamb, uh, and the two of them started growing up together. 
Um, and of course, he was adorable. Um, and of course, we love him to pieces. Um, and of course, he loved his lamb friend, and he loved and he cared for, for us. Um, but there was this way, there was this way, there was this way that he would look at you, that he would just look at you, and he still does now. This is two years later. We'll talk about him in a minute. He would look at you like, where's my mommy? And so now however much like visitors to the sanctuary or people on our Facebook page would be, oh, such a cute picture, such a cute picture. In my head, I see him and I think, where's his mommy, right? And now, now of course, now, of course, it's two years later, Maddox is like this tall. He's the juvenile delinquent of the cow crew. <laughs> he's got these horns and he still has that look sometimes. So his, his name is just perfect, Mad Ox. <laughs> um, and... Um, <laughs> And, 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 oh my gosh, we all love him so much, but I'm still aware that his mother is still there on that dairy farm, having, at this point, have had um, at least one and maybe two other calves uh, uh, taken from her, her body hooked up to machines to be milked twice a day. And I find that I cannot explain, I cannot understand what is happening to her unless I think about it as a situation. At the location of a lot of different systems. I find that I cannot explain her position as a cow in, on lockdown in a dairy farm in what is now called Vermont without reference to the history of the land that is now called Vermont, which didn't used to be occupied by white farmers and to which cows are not native, right? Cows came over with Columbus. So, I mean, we literally cannot understand her situation without at least some reference to the process of colonization that brought cows over, that displaced the native farming system in our region. It was the Abenaki people, and they had a corn, bean, squash agriculture system uh, that worked very well uh, with the particular mountain soils in our region for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, um, uh, so we can't even understand how cows are there, but we need to understand a lot more. We need to understand the material ecology of her situation. We need to understand you know, how it comes to be that this one small state is producing all this milk that is going to all these other places. We need to understand the economic and cultural factors that lead um, farmers in many instances to literally not be able to imagine what else they might do not even be able to imagine what else they might do other than hook up cows to milk machines because like that's farming, right? How, and, and, and so how did that come to seem not just natural, because that just, not just natural, but, 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 but like, like, like the, the tradition that we're supposed to honor. Like, and again, we can't understand that unless we understand the history by which, in, in many cases, quite conscious decisions were made by political leaders to stress particular kinds of immigrants to the region and hold them up as exemplars of the region. Um, and so it comes to be that, um, for many people, the idea of Vermont, you think of the man in the white stoic Yankee and his cows making cheese, and that just seems like what is natural. So we, we can't, we have to understand that, but, but that's not all of it, right? Because why else, what, what, what in the world, what, what in the world also makes it seem natural to like forcibly impregnate, right, cows? And, and, and take their babies away, so sexism is in there too, right? I mean, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't understand the dairy industry um, at all without that. So what I find, um, I may have gone too far, <laughs> um, 
But, but what I find is that I literally cannot, I can't, I can't parse the situation, I can't analyze the situation without reference to the history of the place, without reference to the material ecology of the place, and without reference to the social ecology of the place, including the cultural ideas of the place, including um, uh, the social ecology of the place, would include the economics, would include the legal system, but would also include the attitudes that are dominant within a place, including all of the attitudes about people uh, that often are referred to under the rubric of intersectionality, huh? Does that make sense? So, 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 so it turns out, at least for me, um, that I can't understand a situation, I can't understand the social ecology of the situation unless I'm also paying attention to race and to gender and to other, um, we, 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 we don't want me to stutter my way through everything. Um, so you just fill in the blanks there, dot, dot, dot. Um, um, well, I guess that would be a good time to mention disability. Um, <laughs> um, so, 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 and it turns out that this, um, this idea of intersectionality is, arises from something very similar. And this is like the most important, this may be the most important thing that I say to everybody, not just the people who are new to intersectionality. I think it's really important at this point in our history when um, just in the past few years the idea or at least the word intersectionality has started to be used a lot more widely um, and sometimes really loosely um, to revisit its origins because the origins are in problem solving. The origins are in trying to make sense of a situation in order to solve a problem. Hmm? Okay, so, so, so for me, intersectionality is a conceptual tool. Um, a kind of ecological thinking, a kind of systems thinking that helps us to understand problems, in, in my view, not because it's really interesting, although that can be, for those of us who are intellectuals, that can be really rewarding, but the point is to understand something so that we can solve some problems, huh? Uh, it's not to demonstrate how smart we are or righteous we are, but, but, but to figure stuff out uh, so that we can solve, can solve the problems. Now, the, the, the intellectual history, I mean, obviously I can't, I, we could have a whole course on the intellectual history that led up to um, the first coinage of the term intersectionality by Kimberly Crenshaw. There's not time for that, but what I would like to do is just draw your attention to the fact that the decade before in the 1970s, what was happening um, in lots of different scientific fields um, uh, and many different fields of endeavor was a shift from trying to solve problems by isolating them and analyzing them that way to looking at ecologies, um, trying to understand environmental problems by reference to ecosystems, trying to understand the ecology of poverty. Psychology, which is the field that I have my degree in, actually called itself human ecology for a couple of, of years there. Um, uh, so there was this, this shift in our thinking from sort of seeing problems on their own. And of course, this had been going on in activist circles for the longest time, right? I mean, we can, we can, we can, we can go back to just um, Dr. King talking about, um, you know, who gets credit for things that weren't always his, but, but you know, he was, uh, you know, one of his more famous quotes is to talk about how you can't really, you can't solve racism, um, um, or militarism or economic exploitation alone, like they're all linked, right? And he was talking about this in the late, in, 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 in the mid-1960s, right? So, so this idea that what might seem to be different kinds of problems or different things are actually structurally related to each other was sort of in the air, huh? And of course that was true within the activist circles as well. 
um, within activist circles uh, through much of the 70s. Uh, women of color in particular were doing really hard work within both the feminist movement and in the civil rights movement. Um, uh, on the one hand, drawing attention to gender, on the other hand, drawing attention to race, catching a lot of flack in, in, in both instances, yes. Um, people were really starting to think that was also happening within the feminist movement. The queers were like, um, <clears throat> excuse us. Um, did you ever notice how like homophobia functions as what Suzanne Farrar calls a weapon of sexism, uh, which she wrote, she wrote that book a little bit before uh, Kimberly Princess. Uh, so you, did you ever notice how like they use um, um, terms of der derogatory terms for, for, for gay men and lesbians um, are used to police the gender system, right? Are used to police, like it doesn't actually matter who you want to have sex with. Um, uh, you can be called the F word and beat up for it if you are male or seem to be male and like show tunes rather than football, right? Um, and it doesn't actually matter who you want to sleep with. If you are female or appear to be female and you're more interested in mathematics or sports than a boyfriend, you could be called um, any number of the names that are, that are, that are used to denigrate uh, lesbians. Uh, you could be violated, um, you, uh, you could have somebody rape you to rape the, the dyke out of you. Um, oh, I'm sorry if I triggered anybody, I always feel like I can say that word. Um, uh, 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 so so, so, so this, this was in the air is my point here, this, this idea that different things, so that was the idea that, you know, uh, the, the, the homophobia is not some separate thing from sexism. It's not some separate thing from sexism. It's actually built right in. It's a structural component of sexism. You want to solve sexism? Guess what? You're not going to solve it if you don't solve homophobia, right? Okay, so, so, so this brings us to Kimberly Crenshaw, who uh, was and is a black feminist legal scholar. Um, and she was, um, prior to her writing the papers where she talked about intersectionality, the term that was most frequently used to talk about the situation of black women and other women of color was double jeopardy. Um, the idea of you know, being oppressed both with regard to race and gender. But that was too simplistic. That was too simplistic. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't account for how it's not like just like, oh, racism plus sexism equals worse. Um, it's more like racism and sexism interact with one another uh, to create new and compound forms of disadvantage, right? Um, so, 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 so Kimberly Crenshaw was interested, I, I want to really highlight this problem solving piece of it. She was a, a, a legal scholar and what she was, in, and particularly her realm is employment law. And so what she was really interested in were these situations that would arise, I can't lean over because that makes the mic echo, uh, the, 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 the situations that would arise uh, where black women on the job were experiencing forms of job discrimination that had no legal remedy. And why they had no legal remedy was because you couldn't call it sex discrimination because actually it wasn't also happening to white women. Ooh, and you couldn't call it race discrimination because it wasn't happening to black men. And so these were actual people who could not bring claim in court because they couldn't call it sex discrimination, they couldn't call it race discrimination. What are we gonna call it? Kimberly Crenshaw decided to go, you know, came up with the word intersectional, intersectionality, to talk about the intersection of sexism and racism at which these women found themselves, huh? Okay, so, 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 so I just want us to remember that, 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 that's the point. The point is to understand a situation and then maybe try and come up with some remedies uh, to solve it. Um, of course, since then, lots of people have taken up that idea because it's a really useful conceptual tool. Hmm? Um, and, 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 and have talked about not just 
uh, intersections between race and gender, but also disability, and also homophobia, and also uh, the different ways that people oppress one another based on individual identity characteristics or, or the perception of individual identity differences. And then people also started to, a little bit later, it took a little longer to start thinking about how that all fit with like environmental. Hmm? Uh, and finally, the environmental justice movement arose. Um, uh, looking at the ways that both race and class disadvantage people in terms of being more likely uh, to, uh, to, to live near toxic waste sites and, and, and the like. Um, but what's important to remember, besides the problem solving piece of it, when we talk about intersectionality, it's not just that different forms, what might be different forms of oppression have similar characteristics. That's true, that's just not all of it. And, it. and it's not just that different forms of oppression use the same tactics, yeah, it's like, like stereotyping um, or, 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 or police abuse. Uh, that's true, it's just not all of it. Huh? And it's not just um, that when different forms of oppression inter act, um, they disadvantage individual people in compounded ways. So that's true and really important to know. It's that this is the key. The key is that these different forms of oppression interact with one another in order to create structures of oppression, in order to create systems of oppression. What, 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 what Crenshaw was up to, what others have been up to here is trying to actually understand the mechanics of what we're talking about when we talk about institutional oppression. Um, and the idea here is that the different forms of oppression interact with one another in mutually reinforcing ways, propping each other up so that if you sort of hack away at one, you can get somewhere, but the other one's right there helping it. You know, in, in a similar way, I was just telling you how homophobia helps sexism, huh? Um, and so this tells us that we can't, we can't solve one of the problems unless we are paying at, at least paying attention to the others, right? Um, uh, uh, a good example of this would be um, in the realm of domestic violence, um, where you know, it seemed like a good idea to some feminists to institute mandatory arrest laws um, uh, as a way of dealing with the fact that, that very frequently um, survivors of, sex, uh, of domestic violence uh, will feel so bullied by their partner they're not gonna agree to press charges or go to court, right? Uh, and so for many, many cities instituted these mandatory arrest laws. The idea is that if the police come and they see some evidence of domestic violence, uh, then they have to make an arrest. It's not, they don't have to, the, the victim doesn't have to say, I want to press charges. The police see a bruise, they make an arrest, right? Seems like a good idea if you're down with state interventions um, to solve problems. Um, <laughs> and down with the prison industrial complex. Um, but uh-oh, there's police racism, and there's judicial system racism, and check it, what ends up happening is that women of color who fight back end up getting arrested and incarcerated. What happens is that police get called out on a domestic violence charge, and as recently happened in Minneapolis with Jamar Clark, uh, uh, shoot him dead. Now she may well have wanted the police to come, uh, but it's unlikely uh, that his victim wanted him shot, executed in the street uh, uh, for the assault that he had perpetrated on her. So what does this then, does it make it more or less likely that women of color and particularly black women and particularly women in low income neighborhoods, oh and let's not even talk about undocumented women, 
um, uh, uh, are they going to be more or less likely to seek help when they're being beaten up? Less, right? And so we have this situation where we'll just pull out two pieces of it, racism and sexism again. So here we have this situation where the racism of the police and the criminal justice system make it easier for some men uh, to, um, to perpetrate domestic violence. Yeah? Uh, and may, am I making sense here? Yeah. Okay, I want, okay. Because I, I didn't mean to spend that much time on that example. That was like one little... <laughs> Um, okay, so, so the point is, the point is, the point is, uh, 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 so if you don't solve one, in other words, trying to solve domestic violence by just paying attention to gender and not at all thinking about race leads you to that situation, okay? So that's all I'm trying to say here, that it teaches us um, that trying to solve a problem without reference to the other problems is probably not going to work and you might actually end up doing things that make things worse, huh? Um, but the other piece of it, this is, and this is where it really gets really interesting and really promising, is the idea that these, the different forms of oppression interact with one another in particular ways um, to create structures of oppression, as I said. And so one idea is that if you can identify what I call the joints, like if there's any kind of a, oh yeah, yo, yeah, like, you see like the joints of the, of the beams? You, see, you don't understand what I'm talking about? They're what holds, holds things up, right? If you wanted to bring down this ceiling, please don't do it while we're here. Um, <laughs> it would not be smart to just sort of start in the middle of that beam, right? The thing to do would be to go to the different joints that are holding the structure together. And so one of the ideas, one of the most important ideas with regard to intersectionality is that if you can identify joints, if you can identify intersections and then target the intersections, you're going to be more likely to get one of those things where the systems, they're propping each other up and you do some work that actually helps with both and you destabilize the system more. Huh? Does that make, does that, does that make sense? So, so, so. Um, one example that includes animals that I can think of is the um, is um, uh, uh, milk cow's milk in school lunches. Um, cow's milk in school lunches, uh, which obvi very obviously is oppressive to cows, um, but also turns out to be oppressive. Uh, to, uh, to a significant number of children since the majority of people of color and thus the majority of children of color are lactose intolerant. If you're lactose intolerant and you drink milk, gassy, headachey, doesn't really help with algebra. <laughs> but I'm serious, we laugh a little bit, but how much does this contribute? Because here's the thing. In, in almost all school districts, students who are getting low cost or free breakfast and lunches, and because of the economics of racism, that is disproportionately children of color, are given milk, in many instances are forced to take milk, must take the milk if they want the breakfast, aren't given some other thing to drink, and they're thirsty from what is often a uh, dry-ish breakfast or, 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 and so they'll drink the milk and maybe they don't even know that drinking the milk is what makes them gassy. And then they go to class and maybe, oh, I don't know, I think we have a little piece of the achievement gap. It's not the only piece of the achievement gap, but it's a little piece of the achievement gap. Um, and so, uh, but check it, check it out. It's not just that cows are oppressed this way, it's that this is one of the key ways that the dairy industry maintains its profitability. Okay, people are drinking, at least voluntarily drinking, less and less liquid milk. Decline, d demand for liquid milk has been declining. Why aren't the dairy, why is it the dairy industry suffering anymore? Because they have this captive audience. So if you could do something at that intersection, you'd be helping the kids for sure, and you'd also be helping to kick out a key component of the profitability of the dairy industry, right? That's beautiful. 
So this is what we're talking about, is finding those intersections. Oh, and here's the other thing. Would it be that hard to do? Well, yeah, I mean, they're going to fight back the dairy industry. But now you identify that as a goal, and you can get the animal activists to come on in. You can get the food justice activists to come on in. You can get your local NAACP to come on in, and lots of different people to come on in and say, look, we can't agree about everything, and there's an awful lot of things we won't agree about yet, but we could all agree that our kids should have some alternative to uh, cow's milk. And we can all work together on that, right? And so that's the other benefit of intersectionality is you identify these things and you can bring people together. And when you bring people together to work on a common cause, it's not just that you have now more energy. I mean, literally more people means more energy working on the problem, but you're bringing people from different perspectives together to work on a common goal, which means that as they work together, some sort of fellow feeling is going to arise, some sort of natural cross-pollinization of ideas is going to happen when people chat with each other before or after meetings, or maybe they go out for coffee and then the vegans in the group have to explain uh, why they're gonna not consume this or ask for that. And this time when they hear somebody explain it, it's not some random person holding, who doesn't look like them, holding out a, a, a go vegan brochure on the street that they have no particular reason to stop and listen to but it's somebody who they trust and they've been working with on something, and so they're gonna at least give you a, a fair hearing, yeah? All right, so these are the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful benefits of intersectionality. There are challenges uh, 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 that arise when you start to look at the world in this way. One is that very quickly you come to realize that all of us are situated somewhere on a complex and multifaceted matrix of different ways that people oppress each other, right? And some of us are like straight down the line privileged and a few of us are disadvantaged in every possible way. Except for species, and we'll get there in a minute. But we're just talking about among people right now. Um, but most of us are actually in a mixed position. Most of us are in a mixed position where we might be disadvantaged on account of um, race and gender, but perhaps we're in the advantaged position when it comes to disability or citizenship or religion. Hmm? And that can be really hard to grapple with. People have a really hard time with their privilege. Uh, your privilege tends to be a lot more invisible to you than your disadvantage. Uh, and if you are disad and nobody likes to think of themselves as privileged, because then, what are you gonna do with that information? <laughs> um, like, what does it obligate you to do? And can you still think of yourself in the same way? Huh? Um, and it's even harder in some instances to think about your privilege if you are disadvantaged in some way, because like, you know what disadvantage feels like, so then, wait, wait, I'm the oppressor too? How could this be? No, it cannot be. I mean, so this is really difficult uh, to grapple with and really, Im but really important to grapple with. And I'm here to tell you absolutely possible to grapple with. Um, so that's, that's one challenge. Um, okay. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, so I, I need to move on to intersectionality. And there's many more points to make. So, 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 but I, I do want to, I just want to stress to you that intersectionality is a conceptual tool. It's a way of thinking. Um, I've seen some slippage lately. Um, and, I, and in order to make sure I wasn't the only one who was feeling uncomfortable, um, I talked to some other people who, like me, have been working, uh, at least trying to work deliberately 
um, intersectionally since at least the late 80s or early 90s to say if they, they also felt uncomfortable. And so I talked to, talked to one person who's a white person in academia, another person who's uh, black and pred pre predominantly an activist, um, and a few others, and we all agreed that we're all feeling a little uncomfortable with what's happening lately in terms of people using intersectional as an adjective to describe people. Um, as though you could be an intersectional person or not an intersectional person, because that's just not really consistent with what, uh, it seems to buy into identity. Uh, like, and, and so I just really wanted to stress, like if you have, like if you have an analysis of, um, Analyses can be intersectional. If you're trying to solve a problem and you are analyzing the situation and, and, and you're looking at this and you're looking at that and you're looking at the other and trying to understand how they all come together, then that's an intersectional analysis. And the identity of the person putting forward that analysis is absolutely irrelevant. I mean, it may be irrelevant in terms of whether you trust that particular person or not and whether their knowledge whether the, the analysis is accurate or not, but I, I, I don't think, I, I, I have a hard time thinking of people as intersectional, I, except in the case that we're all at various intersections. Um, I think that analyses can be intersectional or not, I think projects can be intersectional or not, but I, I feel awkward and we'll get to why in a minute um, with, with using it as like an, a, a new identity term. Um, but I need to move on to intersectionality and animals which is really important for this, obviously, gathering. Um, and are you bored yet? No. Do I need to like jump around or something? Okay. Um, no, 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 no. I just, just wanted to make sure. Okay. Because I'm not stopping until you're bored. Um, okay. All right. So, 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 so. I said that people started to think about how this all, so here we have the initial kinds of intersectionality is we're just thinking about the ways that people oppress each other, right? So we'll think of that as interspecies, interspecies intersectionality, right? And then some people have been talking for a while now um, about what we're sort of here to talk about today, which is intra species intersectionality. And so, so we, we have to understand intersectionality in order to understand all the various ways that people oppress each other. Huh? But when we're talking about interest, then we're trying to talk about how all of that relates to how people treat non-human animals and, um, and the environment. Huh? Uh, how does that, all of that relate to, um, and, and what are the connections? What are the connections? Um, and oh yeah, I did. I did it backwards. Yeah. It, it, uh, so it's intra and inter. You understood what I was saying, though, right? Okay. So I just mis messed up. Intra. Yeah. Blah. So 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 so. So when I think of why is it important to think about animals when we're thinking about intersectionality, I. I uh, 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 I think it's important for, there's two different things that we sort of need to be mindful of. One is that for any of us who are interested in solving the problems that non-human animals have as a result of people, of humans, um, whether that's exploitation, hands-on exploitation, captivity, use, et cetera, or the multifaceted problems that free living animals have because of us um, despoiling their environments. Um, uh, I think that we can't understand how people act or how people think without reference to their social ecology, uh, including all of the things that go under the rubric of intersectionality. Like if, 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 the, if every person who does something to an animal is a, a person in a particular social situation uh, with particular sets of ideas and habits and behaviors that are rooted in that social situation. 
And how are you, you, you you're gonna, you, you can't understand these social situations and not think about race. How are these situations and not think about gender? Um, how are you, so, so the social ecologies in which every single act of animal exploitation occurs are colored by, are patterned by racism, are patterned by sexism, are patterned by ableism, yeah? And so we can't hope to solve these problems uh, while not paying attention to these extremely important determinants of human behavior. The other piece, and this is why social justice and environmental activists also need to be thinking about animals, and that's because speciesism turns out to be, if you do an intersectional analysis, uh, foundational to other forms of oppression, to the ways that people oppress each other. If you look at any of the most common justifications that people use for their presumed superiority over animals, their presumed right to do whatever they want to other animals without regard to what the animals themselves want, their presumed right to displace animals, to own animals, to kill animals, to make them work without pay, and all of the other things that we know people do to animals. If you look at the justifications that people give, you will find that every one of them is a dangerous way of thinking that leads directly to some form of abuse of people. Might makes right. God told us we could do it. We have some characteristic or we have some capacity that they don't have. We have some, let's pivot more clearly, ability that they don't have. And therefore, we may exploit them, we may own them, we may control their reproduction, we may lock them up. If you don't know your disability history, every one of those things been done to people with disabilities with exactly this, and it is still being done to people with disabilities, uh, with exactly the same justification, right? They can't communicate like we do. They're not as rational as we are. Every, if you look at, I don't have time to go through all of them because that's a lecture all by itself. If I'm talking to a social justice audience, that's the whole lecture, right? I just go through all of them and show exactly how they lead to racism. Uh, but, 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 but do it for yourself, right? Do it for yourself. You'll find that any of the ways of thinking uh, that justify animal exploitation lead directly to uh, abuses of human. They're dangerous ways of thinking that lead directly to violence. Furthermore, the attitudes, the behaviors, the way of being in the world that is a function of exploiting animals also is extremely hurtful. Callousness, mindlessness, right? How do most people consume animals every day? Well, some of them say they just don't give a fuck. That's kind of dangerous, right? I don't care who I hurt, I like it. Um, but most people are like, uh, you know, I just don't think about it. I just don't think about it. So uh, and they get practice in just not thinking about it three times a day. Three times a day practice in knowing very well that this hurts somebody but not caring. Practice three times a day and just not thinking about where something came from because it makes me too uncomfortable. Ain't nobody can tell me that doesn't then make you more likely to buy slave-produced chocolate um, or, or, or consumer goods based in child, made from child labor, right? So these are also dangerous ways of being in the world, huh? So this is why other people uh, who aren't already animal advocates really need to be including speciesism in their intersectional analyses. Um, 
And just to give one example of how, um, how uh, uh, they're, they're speaking, because we, it's been too long, we haven't talked about any animals recently, and that's really, un I need, you need to, we need to not have the animals be absent. So one of the things about Vine is that we were, we were the first sanctuary to figure out how to rehabilitate roosters used in cockfighting um, so that they don't have to be euthanized. And that happened because uh, we, as feminists, who started an, uh, a farmed animal sanctuary, uh, 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 refused to believe gender stereotypes um, about chickens. Uh, and so, the, to, to make a quite long story fairly short, uh, the first few uh, animal, uh, chickens that we uh, took in, it, the sanctuary started where Miriam Jones and I literally found a chicken on the side of the road. Um, she turned out to be a he. Um, don't have time to describe to you the comical explanations I came up with for what that sound that turned out to be crowing was. Um, <laughs> I grew up in Baltimore City, okay? Um, but, but, but here's the thing. Once we discovered that this hen to whom we'd begun to feel close was a rooster, our feelings changed, or I'll just say my feelings changed. Uh, and I had to work really hard to not have ideas that suddenly started coming into my head. Roosters, arrogant, aggressive, want to rule the roost. Um, uh, and so then I started to ask myself, well, where did those ideas come from? Because as I've said, I grew up in Baltimore City. It's not like my grandmother who raised me sat me down and said, now, I want to tell you, roosters are one way <laughs> and hens are another way, right? We weren't talking about farmed animals. Um, um, okay, we started, we're gonna, yeah, I'll try. Um, so, um, um, uh, but the point is, so, 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 so one, I had to work really hard to not have those stereotypes influence how I saw this, this animal. It was like I was suddenly looking at him through stereotype colored sunglasses. Um, and I got mad about that because um, I don't like my relationships to be messed up by stereotypes. And so, and so I, I, I thought really hard about where did I get these ideas about roosters. And it came to me, it wasn't that hard to come up with children's books, cartoons, uh, movies. All of, of, of our, so many of our children's media are, 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 are based on gender depictions of animals. Um, and those teach us that um, gender is natural. I mean, the law, to take, take what is another lecture and sum it down to 30 seconds, uh, 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 we think of animals as natural. And so if roosters are naturally aggressive, well, then that's, a pretty, then, then that's taken as evidence that males are inherently more aggressive than females, right? Does that make sense? Okay, um, and so it turns out that, that so that would, be, that would be one example of that. Oh, well, oh my God, okay. Another really, another really good idea. What did I want to tell you about this? Oh, okay. So another important thing that I can't tell you that much about is called standpoint. That's another really important feminist uh, conceptual tool um, that was developed mostly by feminists of color. The basic idea is that really, this is super simple, but what you can see depends on where you stand. What you can see depends on where you stand, and, and different people with different standpoints are able to see different things. Huh? Different people with different standpoints are able to see different things. Um, and uh, this is one more reason for anybody who, in this room who would doubt it, which I don't think is very many, why we need to make sure that our, our organizations are diverse in lots of different ways. Um, because. Uh, uh, different people from different standpoints, and your standpoint is not just like your identity, but your life history uh, and where you are now. Different people in different standpoints are able to see different things, able to understand situations differently, able to see different solutions, right? Um, if, if it had been left to, I mean, the Montgomery bus boycott never would have happened. Um, except that the women who came up with that were in a position, many of them were domestic workers, uh, and they knew that if they, now it wasn't just boycotting the buses, it was that the domestic workers weren't going to get to all these 
white households where all the rich people were, and the rich people weren't going to have their food cooked anymore, and the rich people weren't going to have their laundry done anymore. And it wasn't just the bus system that was going to grind to a halt, but all of the most affluent households were going to go haywire. Right? And, 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 you, and, and you can't tell me that anybody else would have had that insight, right? Or seen that thing to do, which turned out to be a pivotal moment in the civil rights movement, yes? Uh, and so, so from your own standpoint, you don't know the things that you can't see. This is why you need to be coming to places like this and talking with lots of different people. Um, but my standpoint, I just want to say one piece of my standpoint is that I spent years and years and years as a social justice activist before I found that chicken by the side of the road. Found the chicken by the side of the road in 2000. Um, before that, I had been a tenant organizer. I'd been an anti-racist organizer. Um, I went to my first gay rights rally in 1976 when I was 14 years old. Um, um, and so I have, and now it's been 16 years um, in the animal advocacy movement, and so I have seen the best but also the worst of not just the animal movement, because there's some, lots of critiques that we'll be hearing, but also of the left or progressives or whatever you want to call uh, 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 folks uh, who are doing anti-poverty work and anti-racist work. It's not like uh, there's not flaws there too, right? Uh, and uh, the refusal to look at animals is just one of those. And so I want to say, as we're making this move within the animal rights movement to, be, be, to, to have more intersectional analyses and to have more intersectional processes, let's be careful not to reproduce the worst of the animal rights movement just under the new guise of intersectionality uh, by, because when I think of the worsts of both movements, actually they're kind of the same. So let me just say a few of these worsts. I'm sorry, this is the down. Um, okay, so a tendency to like make things all about personal identity rather than structures. Um, uh, a tendency to focus a lot on personal purity. Let me go back to the identity, though. Like with veganism, like if you make it about veganism, where are the animals? Um, if you just make it about your identity as a vegan, like to me that's like problematic. Um, uh, 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 per, uh, overwhelming concern with personal purity and righteousness. Um, uh, uh, one problem with that is, again, here you're just looking at yourself, and all you're concerned about is my personal purity, my righteousness, whether I am or whether I at least seem pure and righteous to others. Well, again, where are the animals there if all the focus is on me and my personal purity? Um, uh, but the other piece of that is that it does fall into that good person problem that good person problem, that I idea that we, and, and the left has really struggled with this too, you know, this, this paradigm that like, if you've been, if you're, if you're a victim, then you must be innocent, and innocent is good. Um, and so it, then it becomes really hard to see that actually people tend to be both. Um, most of us are perfectly capable of both good and bad actions and do some of each before noon each day. Um, uh, but if we're focused on this like good personness, um, I think uh, that can be problematic. Another problem is immateriality, uh, uh, over concern with ideas um, and uh, rather than the material uh, uh, um, factors that also play into. Um, our problems. I know I'm out of time, so I'll just say, and the other one is, oh, I just wrote ungenerous righteousness. Um, so, 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 so let's try and avoid that. Okay, so, um, okay, so I'm just going to close out with, the, with, okay, so there was, there was these two ducks. The, there was a, the, the, this last story and then we'll be done. Okay, so, 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 so we started out as a chicken sanctuary. We're now like 500 animals and, and counting and all different species. But at first we were just a chicken sanctuary surrounded by poultry farms. 
And then at some point, we took in uh, a group of ducks rescued from a foie gras factory. Uh, and they turned out to be like the most adorable and charming people that you would ever meet. How many people have ever met ducks? Right? I mean, they're so social. They're so interested in everything. And oh, every day is a new day. And <laughs> water is so great. Um, I mean, you know, who can live with ducks and not just be so happy? Right? And so we were just delighted with these ducks. We loved the way that they were so kind to each other. We loved the way that they were kind to the chickens. And they, these were big ducks. They were bigger than a lot of little chickens. Some of them even adopted some of the injured chickens. The thing is, so, so, so there, were, and there were eight ducks. And when we, they moved in, we didn't have enough room to put them in, in, in either one of our coops. right? And so we spent a little time with them. We tried to figure out who was friends with who. And then we put, you know, uh, four of them went into one of the coops and four went into the other coop. Um, one day I come out and to, I don't know, do some kind of chore, and, 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 and two of them are, 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 are fighting with each other. And, and, and I was really, really uh, upset because the ducks. And so I was like, no, this is a sanctuary. <laughs> Even the fighting roosters don't fight here. You cannot fight here. What is this? So, so, so I tried to figure out like who is the aggressor and who is the victim. And I took the victim and I took him over to the other coop where he would be safe. Right? Went about my business. I don't know what I was doing. Putting down straw, refilling water bowls, whatever. Maybe 45 minutes, an hour went by. I turn around and there's the one that I put in the other coop trying desperately to get over this one fence, talking, 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 talking to the one who'd been attacking him. And, and, and you don't know, because I'll th this was amazing because how he, what he had to do to actually get from one to the other was he had to walk through the yard, he had to climb a six foot fence, he had to walk through the woods to make a sharp left turn, <laughs> walk up the driveway, make another sharp left turn, and then start climbing this last little half fence, which is where I had found him. So I was like, whoa, I made a mistake. You must be friends. You're having some kind of argument. <laughs> All right, so, so I picked him up, and I helped him over the fence. And they were like, yes, 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 we're reunited. Go, go, go. go about my business. Come back out an hour later to check the waters or whatever. And they're fighting again. So I separate them. Sure enough, hour later, he had walked through the path, <laughs> climbed the six-foot fence, walked through the woods, made the sharp left turn, walked up the driveway, and this time he was, he was like almost over that last fence. Um, three times this happened before I literally hit my head with my hand. That wasn't fighting, it was sex. They were boyfriends. They were boyfriends. So we called them Jean-Paul and Jean-Claude. And, um, and, and they were boyfriends for life. Uh, they hung out together every day. They went to sleep together in the coop every night. I'm not saying they were monogamous. <laughs> because ducks tend not to be. But here's the deal. I was this lesbian feminist who had read this book called Biological Exuberance, which is like this doorstopper of a book that, that, that tells us the hundreds of different animals, including ducks, who engage in same-sex sex, pair bonding, courtship, um, shows of a, displays of affection, and even child rearing. I knew that. And yet, the presumption of animal heterosexuality was so strong that I almost broke up <laughs> that couple. I did break up that couple. They just refused to be broken up, <laughs> right? 
So that, of course, got me thinking about another little structural link between different forms of oppression, this idea that homosexuality is unnatural, this idea that homosexuality is unnatural, which obviously has been used for a very long time to denigrate uh, those of us who participate in the same sex, those of us humans who participate in same sex courtship or pair bonding um, or sex or child rearing. Um, but also actually turns out to hurt animals too. Um, because I don't know if you've ever noted, if you think about it, anytime you learn about animals on like these nature shows or whatever, uh, they are portrayed as reproducing automatons whose only concern is to get their genes into the next generation, right? If you ever watch one of those nature shows on TV or pick up one of those little pop science articles, almost all the time what you see is every single behavior of an animal explained by reference to his or her presumed drive to reproduce. Huh? And so, like they're little reproducing robots. And of course, if you're a robot, it doesn't hurt to lock up a robot in a foie gras factory, does it? So, you know, this idea, you know, if we, but if you admit that ducks fall in love, have sex just because they want to, are so attached to each other, well, then you have to acknowledge that they have feelings then you have to acknowledge they have intentionality. You have to acknowledge they have projects of their own, right? Oh, and also, and so when you undermine, when you just undermine that one thing, homosexuality is unnatural. You're helping out the, the LGBTQ people, you're helping out the animals, and you're also helping out the ecosystem, because reprocentrism, this idea that like reproduction is the be all and end all of life for all animals, including human animals, well, my gosh, that's like such an important um, component of capitalism, overpopulation, right? And so when you start to undermine reprocentrism, so there, here we have another example of how doing an intersection and analysis can lead you to something where if you just kick out that one keystone, you're undermining quite a few oppressive systems. Does that make sense? Okay, so those were the things I wanted to tell you about Jean Paul and Jean Claude um, in terms of the structural, but the two other pieces, and then I'm done. And one is that please notice that I made mistakes. Like, I literally made mistakes there, right? I separated them. Um, and that leads us to something that Christopher said, which is you will fuck up. Like, you really will. You're going to mess up trying to do intersectional work. I assure you, you will. And the people that you offend may or may not forgive you. Uh, but you just have to go on and just keep on keeping on. Um, and feel free to sing that song. Um, <laughs> but I, the last thing that I wanted to, 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 to tell you about is, yeah, I messed up and I separated them, but they refused to be separated, right? They refused. He really did walk through that path. I'm not just exaggerating it because it makes a good story. He literally did three times walk through that, climb, woods, left turn, the whole deal to get back to his boyfriend. That's some power. huh? And if you think about it, right, if you think about it, think about all the times here in the United States, homosexuality used to be illegal, right? In some parts of the initial, initial colonies, death penalty. There's still places in the world where you get the death penalty for homosexual behavior, or at least locked up. Does it stop people from doing it? No. Right. Same thing with laws about um, what was called miscegenation, right? Uh, uh, sex uh, or marriage between the races. They said, don't do it. They said, it's illegal, but people fell in love or just were hot for each other and did it anyway, right? Did it anyway. This is really important to realize because it tells us that there's a force, I call it eros, eros or eros, you can pronounce it either way you want, E-R-O-S. You can call it some other force, some other word. The word doesn't matter. The point is that desire drives 
everything. And that, that kind of desire, not, to, not desire for some temporary transitory pleasure that can be bought with a credit card, but for a relationship, a meaningful relationship. Doesn't have to be a sexual relationship, right? But, but for a relationship, that desire is in every one of us stronger than all the guns and money of all the governments and corporations. Free, renewable. This is our source of energy. This is our source of energy. And check it, that desire for real connection, real relationships is in everybody, not just those of us here. It's also in the people who are doing the things they wish they wouldn't, we wish they wouldn't do to other people or to animals. They also, somewhere locked up in them, they want better relationships. They want much more sustaining pleasures than the crap that's being fed to them by late consumer capitalism, huh? And so we can be aware of that for two reasons. One, in terms of tapping into our own wellspring to guide our, to, to be the power for our actions, but also always being mindful not only of the socially and material ecologies of the situations that we're analyzing, but that for every human being and every one of them, there is that wellspring of desire. If there's some way to tap into that, to pull them towards better behavior, you know you're going to be making them happier too, um, and maybe you get a little less pushback. Um, if you can find ways to tap into that. Huh? So that's some of the things that I have learned about intersectionality from Maddox, uh, for the Fighting Cox, and uh, from Jean-Paul and Jean-Claude. May they rest in peace. Thank you for listening to me. And I think it's dinner time, right? <laughs>